Today I want to actually analyze a couple recent mixing projects that were done in DP9 that relate to working with an orchestra. Editing, mixing, organizing tracks. So let's dive in here. I want to show you a presentation uh, involving a composition by a friend of mine, a composer here in LA from Italy, Massimo Sami. He and a co-writer uh, wrote this beautiful piece of music that I mixed. And this is Amy Karstensen from New York. She's a singer, songwriter, artist. And so together they made this beautiful piece of music and when they decided to actually fully record it, he mocked it up in Digital Performer, and he exported the files and created the score and took it to Budapest and hired an orchestra, and we got the files back, re-imported them to DP, and it was my job to edit and mix the files. So I want to kind of take you through the DP project. So you can see, I'm going to switch themes for just a moment, because I sort of like a little bit darker, and in Digital Performer, I'm going to go to the themes and double click, bring in something a little, little darker here. The other thing I want to do to make my life a little easier is I want to import my own custom shortcuts or key bindings. So I can go up to Setup, Commands, and I want to import my own custom key bindings. And you, when it says shows conflicts, you can just override them and say, use my custom, please. So here we are. And of course, right off the bat, you can see we've got color coding of, of various elements of the orchestra. So We've got the yellow are the spot mics, and of course these orange mics are the room mics, the deca tree, the rears, and the wides. Because obviously recording an orchestra is all about the sound of the players, the room, the microphones. So that's primarily the sound, right? You want to get a very good sound of the orchestra. And then you do have spot mics if you want to be able to get a more intimate sound, or you want to be able to pull up various elements, solos and things, you have the ability to use the spot mics. And you can see we've got a stereo piano that was recorded both in and out, I think that was a, a both a, an XY and Bloom Line pair and a room mic for the piano and then of course the vocal and I've got one reverb that I'm using to mix with the orchestra. So if we go into the sequence editor, you can see how we've got the ability to look at automation that I put in across all of the various tracks. And in DP, it's very easy to be able to select and be able to move audio information, automate them in, in various ways. So we're able to, you know, let's if you want to increase or decrease our levels, we can do so very quickly. Of course, you can use control surfaces in Digital Performer if you'd like. So in terms of uh, importing the files, um, I wanted to mention something. It's very easy to create a composite or comp tracks together. So if I wanted to, uh, let's say I highlight these tracks, these all the orchestral tracks, and I can just go Shift-Command-G, will let me create a new group. And, and these are all the... Uh, Let's look at the attributes of the group. I just want to have it be uh, dealing with tracks in terms of uh, take, adding or deleting takes or renaming the takes. So we can actually now duplicate the take. We can rename the take. And so let's say we have take one, take two, and I want to take a section of take two, and I can just lasso across, and I can copy, switch between the various takes, and paste. So when it comes to dealing with taking playlists out of Pro Tools, right? and importing them into DP as separate takes, it's very easy to copy and paste between the various takes as you build and do crossfades. So we can just do that. And of course, we have unlimited undos in DP, so we can get back to the very beginning. Um, I want to take a look at the vocal for just a minute and show you the way that I like to process the vocal. So let's go down here in the track selector and show the vo vocal view. You can see my automation, and you'll notice these dips. Sometimes when you're dealing with a vocalist, uh, you'll have sibilant issues, or you might have a little too harsh consonants, S's and things. Sometimes I, I use, like to use de but I also like to sometimes do dips in automation on various hard consonants. So I'll play you the track, part of the track, so you can kind of hear, and we'll look at some of the vocal uh, automation that I did. And so what I did, because I like to use various plugins that are not loaded on this system, so I went ahead and made stems of, the, uh, of basically the the breakdown. So here's the stereo piano orchestra vocal, and I went ahead and separated the reverb as its own stem. So sometimes the composer in this case did want a delivery of these stems so that later on they could do a, a, um, an instrumental version, they could do an edit version, they could change the reverb if they wanted to because they had the various elements of the orchestra. So I'll go ahead and play back and I'll show you they made a video of this beautiful piece of music and we'll play it here from this spot. Stars, they hold my gaze I want 
wonder where you are. Are you up there staring back at me? Find me the answer. My heart's question cries of why you could not stay. Beautifully recorded, beautifully played. It's such a joy when you have live players. And so I just wanted to show you importing those files and mixing them, and of course, being able to deliver stems and full mixes. And I want to talk just briefly about some of the audio plugins that I, I like to use when I'm mixing scores. One of the tricks that you kind of learn is, especially when you're dealing with a hybrid score that's MIDI and live, is you want a little more energy, a little more girth, a little more weight in the mix. Waves makes a beautiful plugin called Low Air. Now what this does is it lets me add a sub octave. And I just tuck it in underneath and it creates this really beautiful under sort of blanket as you will, if you will, underneath the orchestra and it gives it a sense of weight. Now that room had some nice air moving and it had contrabasses, but I wanted just a pinch more because it's sort of a pop jazz sensibility and I wanted it to have a little more weight. So I love Low Air and of course the Masterworks EQ is a beautiful plugin that comes with Digital Performer. And it's, you'll notice that, and this is the EQ settings that I used on this particular score, you'll notice I like to take a subtractive approach to mixing an orchestra. I want to usually, I find, you'll notice, see the notching that happens in the upper mids? What happens in an orchestra, obviously you have multiple players playing notes and they're creating frequencies and overtones. And sometimes, based on the microphone positions, the players in the room, you'll get a little bit of uh, buildup a little bit of build up. What's funny is when you mix good projects, they turn out well. In a lot of ways, the mixing engineer is not really, he's benefiting from great arrangements and great playing. So uh, really the composer, if it does a great job of writing and arranging, it makes my job very easy. But even in, the, even in best case scenario, there's still gonna be some notching that has to happen. So it basically, if there's build up in high frequencies, I can fix those. The other plugins that I really love I love Universal Audio's Brainworks. It's called the B, B, uh, excuse me, the BXV2, and this is an excellent mid-side processor. So you'll see at the top you have a mono section and you have the stereo section, and you can EQ those separately. Okay, you can also change the width if you want to on an orchestra. I've made it a little bit wider. It also has deessing, which I don't use really on an orchestra, but this is a great product if you have if you're working on some kind of a mix where the overall mix has a little bit of harshness to it, and you want to be able to soften it just a little bit, you can use the de which takes a little bit of the edge off of a mix. So just keep that in mind. Now this is a product that works with the uh, Universal Audio platform, right, which works well with Digital Performer. I also wanted to mention I love the SSL bus compressor. That's a great compressor. Now, it's interesting, you go, well, what are you compressing in this mix? This mix, I'm just using a little bit of the compression to add just a little bit of uh, just a little bit of control and just kind of hold, kind of create sort of a foundation. And so it's not really pumping, it's just sort of creating a little bit of an atmosphere and it's creating a little bit of a gel, gluey effect with the orchestra. So I like the sound of that. And of course, I love the L3 limiter, which I use just sparingly, and I love Altiverb. Altiverb was obviously the original company that made impulse responses, and they are still, in my mind, the leader when it comes to creating fantastic acoustical spaces. So I, I, I'm using this uh, particular preset, Mechanics Hall, which is a, actually, believe it or not, it's in New England, and it's a beautiful sounding room, and so I'm using just a hint of that on this orchestra. So now we're gonna switch gears. We're gonna go over Don Davis. You guys, do you guys know Don Davis? He's a fantastic film composer. We're gonna, I wanna show you a clip of a very famous score that Don Davis did 
Um, you know, he's well known for Beauty and the Beast. He did Jurassic Park 3. And he's also, he also did the Matrix trilogy, which, you know, wow, what a, what a great... I mean, what, science fiction movies, and that's one of my favorite science fiction trilogies is The Matrix. So I happen to have here, and I'm going to switch back to Digital Performer and bring up the next chunk, which happens to be the very cue that Don Davis gave us. He's a Digital Performer user. And this takes us back now, 15 years, we're going to be going back in time to when The Matrix came out, and of course, using Digital Performer to create an, his score. And so we're going to watch a, a few minutes, just a minute of a clip from this great fight scene in Matrix Reloaded. And you can see, one of the things I always like to see with, with film composers is how they did their, their conductor tracks. Now look at this for just a moment. If I go to the conductor track, and I go Shift-G, and it opens up, the purple line represents the tempo. And you'll see along the top, those, the measures, you'll see the time signatures. Now when I play it, maybe I can do so in such a way that you'll see how Don Davis likes to you know, make his decisions about tempo and his decisions about meters. It's such a neat thing about film scoring. Film scoring is such a, a nice combination of, of emotion and feel and artistic and science and time code, and it's such a nice hybrid. I think it's, uh, it's, that's what's so intriguing about film scoring. So I'll leave it up in such a way that you can watch the scene and you can see the time, the time signatures change. So let's go back to the video window, Shift V, and I'll pull this down and let's, and let's watch the cue. That's definitely one of his signatures. Though when he, remember when this movie came out, that whole stop sort of frame thing that they invented, the filmmakers, and Don does those beautiful brass swells I love on those sections. But you can see, you know, Don did such a fab, fantastic job with these action cues. Uh, and this was his digital performer document. So I kind of wanted to say, hey, it's been 15 years. And the reason why I also bring up Don Davis was because this last, uh, very recently over the past few weeks, I was uh, invited to actually mix one of Don Davis's film scores. So as a mixer, it was a real delight to work on something that, this was a film called Hyperspace, which was Don Davis's first feature film. Okay, imagine this, it's 1984, right? And he gets hired to do what Hyperspace, which is interesting about this film, is it's a Star Wars parody, okay? Which is kind of interesting, it was like the first Star Wars parody. And there's a well-known character in the film called Buckethead. And maybe you've seen Buckethead in the news he was sort of in a political news recently in London and the UK. But what's interesting, of course, this was recorded in 1984, a 60-piece orchestra. And I don't know the LA studio. Of course, it was recorded on 24-track, 2-inch, right, at 15 ips. And what's interesting about it, I got it from the studio. It was all recorded into Pro Tools, transferred to a transfer house. And what's interesting is I had very little track sheet information, right? So it was sort of an investigation of, okay, what's what? So I was able to go through and find, okay, these are the room mics, or these are the brass mics, these are the trumpets, these are the, and I want to go back and show you how I ended up finding out what things were in these, in these reels. So we'll go back to Digital Performer and switch over to Hyperspace. So these are, this is just a fraction of the cues that I loaded in that mixed from Hyperspace. And you'll see a lot of markers. One of the ways that I like to approach mixing uh, a film score is if you, if you know the, that the recording was done in one studio with one set of you know, microphones, you don't have to do the work obviously more than once in terms of setting up the tracks, right? So you'll notice in my folder here, these are, you know, this is the way that they came in numbered out of Pro Tools, okay? It's not how I would necessarily arrange them when I'm working, but I wanted to keep them in numerical order. So you'll notice now, if I, if once I start loading in cues, I can set them where they need to go in the timeline. So let me actually zoom and Digital Performer, and I want to switch to the Finder for a moment. I've got a folder of some various hyperspace files. If I select all and drop them in Digital Performer, we'll take a minute and let them load in, and it's fast. 
So you'll notice that these are in the same exact order, so it's very easy for me to grab these. And now I can just, as I keep working, I'm building and bringing in each and every set of files for each queue. So I'm kind of working in a linear fashion. I don't have to worry about time code. This is no reference to time code for picture. It's just me remixing the score so they can be re-released on a soundtrack label. So um, now that they're in there, what I like to do is we can undo that. I like to set markers. So let's save this here. We'll zoom back in. Let's, let's go into the sequence editor. And you see where I've got these markers set up. Well, one of the great things about, about markers is how you can make the selection. So when this piece of music ends, you see how the region cuts off? But the reverb tail might go over the region, right? So I've already figured out that this is the end of that region, which gives me plenty of tail. Because these files will end up going to a mastering company, mastering engineer, to be finished for, before the release. So after I've done, and you'll notice in here, you know, various cuts and edits, I might actually bite gain up various parts. Sometimes certain percussion elements get lost and I'm able to go in and gain them up and I'll show you the way that we did the panning you know obviously orchestral pan and again I don't really have unfortunately all of the plugins that I used but I do a pretty minimal approach if, if the recording is very good I don't really want to do much to it mostly want to heavily rely on the, on the rooms and then again a bit of spot mics but, but one thing I love about markers is when I'm ready to start bouncing out my files all I have to do is just click on the first marker, and DP intuitively knows, oh, marker one to marker two. And I've got plenty of post roll beyond the region for the reverb tail. So now I can just go Control-J, I'm gonna bounce to disk, and, I'm, and I'm, I would obviously choose a stereo, probably a broadcast wave file, a 24-bit, 48 kilohertz file. And that would be very, then I'm done with that bounce. I go up to bounce two, highlight, let me zoom in just slightly on this one, because it's a little tighter. There's two. So it's a very unique thing that you can do in DP. you be able to set the markers and be able to make selections based on markers and be able to do bounces. So, but I want to play you a little bit of this cue because one of the things about it being a Star Wars parody is obviously is that it's, it's supposed to sound like Star Wars, right? But you can only get so close. And so this is, you'll hear it like some, some Star Wars influence in this score. So I want to play you actually one of my favorite cues from this. Um, and this is marker number four. So let's play that. So you can tell there's a very heroic kind of style to it. And it's, you know, what's really kind of fun about these projects is being able to go through and listen to the slates and listen to the, the talking and the, the chattering that goes on between the various projects. We're teleported back to 1984. It's amazing, you know, you think about a, a stu studio today, I mean, in, in 1984 you still had the best microphones, consoles, tape recorders, engineers, assistants. I mean, so sonically, it's, it's fantastic. It's as if it was recorded today. It was, that's how good uh, these scores hold up. And so it's a real delight to be able to work. And fun thing for me was uh, afterwards, you know, Don was thrilled with the score. He liked it very much. And he, you know, he signed something for me. And so that was neat. Don Davis, who's a digital performer user, who after all these years, I ended up going back and remixing one of his scores, which was fun. But the, thing, the great thing about DP, obviously, is that the audio engine is fantastic. I mean, you basically, you're, we're at a time now where with the right mixing tools, I mean, and great converters and speakers, the sky's the limit. 